June 13, 1973, I walked a half block of 13th Street in my hometown of Norfolk, a small city in northeast Nebraska. And whatever comes our way. Also known as U.S. Highway 81, my grandfather had described 13th Street as a Pan-American highway stretching from the wilds of northern Canada through North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, uh, where the highway passed within 100 yards of my house, down through Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and into Mexico through Central America and into South America, ending at Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of Chile. I understood the road in that context, a ribbon of experiences connected with concrete, asphalt, gravel, and the time it takes to travel that road. On that day in June, at the age of 19, I loaded a sleeping bag, a couple pairs of jeans, enough t-shirts for a week, a sweater, a journal, a road map, my toothbrush, and a towel into a Jansport backpack. I walked the half block to 13th Street and stood on a corner with my thumb sticking out, the universal sign for hitchhiking. I had just finished a year of school at Doan College in Crete, Nebraska, studying music and theater. I enjoyed it so much I decided to quit because I didn't want to rush through it. I think maybe a broken heart might have encouraged my decision to take to the road. In addition to my meager possessions, I carried the lyrics to Melissa, a song by the Allman Brothers Band, typed and folded on a piece of notebook paper. Freight train. Each car looks the same. All the same. And no one knows the gypsy's name. a romantic than an explorer of equal criticism. I had no goal in mind nor destination. The extent of my planning centered on my method of traveling. Hitchhiking, hopping into the vehicles of strangers and trusting that I could connect with each of them in a meaningful way, sharing stories over the miles. On that summer day, half a century ago, I could hardly contain my excitement for these new adventures that lay ahead of me. Within 10 minutes, my first ride slowed and a door opened. I exchanged pleasantries with the driver and climbed in with my backpack. Turns out uh, the driver, Gary Anderson, knew my dad and with his three boys was headed to Gavin's Point, a recreation area on Lewis and Clark Lake on the border of Nebraska and South Dakota, about 60 miles north on U.S. Highway 81. And would I like to travel with them and stay in their cabin on my first night? I exchanged my fantasy of sleeping under the stars and the right-of-way for something that resembled a mini-vacation with a family unit complete with children. I agreed to Gary's offer more out of an acknowledgment of his hospitality than my desire to sleep in a family cabin fast beside a Midwestern flood control project on the Missouri River. I postponed my desires to travel the highways of America unfettered and unencumbered. Plenty of time for that later, I told myself. Looking back at that trip and my recollection of it, I can look to memoirist William Least Heat Moon, who summarized his experiences on the road, along with the changes that happened to him over a lifetime. He wrote Blue Highways, A Journey into America, published in 1982. The book detailed his aimless travels, a time he spent collecting stories and searching for meaning in his own life. More than 32 years later, he reflected on that time in a book, Writing Blue Highways, the story of how a book happened, published in 2014. He writes, quote, autobiography is a poorly named genre. After all, when we tell stories about ourselves, we're speaking not of who we are, but who we have been. Somebody we once were, one who no longer exists, except in memory, 
that mental function more attractive to errors, distortions, and fantasies than the myths of the American West or Sasquatch or cavity probes by aliens. End quote. At the age of 19, I knew to bring on my trip a notebook and a pen to keep track of my experiences. More than a tally of the days, I wanted to record my feelings on the road. Although at the time, I had little awareness of the value of emotions over facts, I trusted myself to write down the most important parts of each day. Accounts of writers on the road fill many shelves of libraries. Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck, Roughing It by Mark Twain, On the Road by Jack Kerouac, Wild by Cheryl Strayed. These accounts all connected direct experiences with literary texts. In an essay, Literary Studies in an Age of Environmental Crisis, former English professor Cheryl Gafelti raises interesting points on how literary theory examines the relationships between writers, their written words, and the world around them. She writes, quote, most eco-critical work shares a common motivation, the troubling awareness that we have reached the age of environmental limits, a time when the consequences of human actions are damaging the planet's basic life support system. In a paper by Fisola Kelly Kinawai entitled, How Can Literature Tackle Climate Change? The author makes two important points regarding the value of fiction, poetry, storytelling, and other literary art forms and dealing with climate change or other environmental factors. One, because so many of us live in what she calls a post-nature world of urbanization and industrialization, we have a difficult time understanding what is lost when we think about nature because of our inability to establish a baseline for comparison. Two, quote, literature works on our senses to make us feel. Our brains are engaged as we read vivid imagery, end quote. An action that illuminates threats of climate change in regard to our daily lives, and not merely as a headline on a news feed, but as something we can feel. For further affirmation, novelist Ursula K. Le Guin, in her essay, The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, 1986, imagines a settlement of early humans making a transition between gathering and hunting. She writes, quote, The skillful hunters then would come staggering back with a load of meat, a lot of ivory, and a story. It wasn't the meat that made the difference. It was the story, end quote. How we, as creators, tell that story makes the difference. My interest lies in translating first-hand experiences into pieces of literature and art. As much as the hunters had no idea about the journey ahead of them, at the age of 19 I had no idea of how my experiences on the road would affect me. I now better understand how my travels and explorations fit into first-wave eco-criticism, the celebration of nature by experiencing it firsthand. Those experiences now allow me to write authoritatively about these places. After a night of skiing on the Continental Divide in Yellowstone National Park with only the light of the full moon, I can help other people understand the power of those silent, wild places and the value of keeping them in that condition. For many writers, translating experiences onto the printed page can present a challenge. More than 160 years ago, his publisher gave Mark Twain the opportunity to share the story of his travels to the West. George Plimpton, in an introduction to a 1996 reprinting of Twain's Roughing It, notes that after the success of Innocence Abroad, published in 1869, Twain received encouragement from his publisher to write about his experiences in the West. Plimpton writes, quote, Twain, living in Buffalo, New York with his new bride, was eager enough to do this, starting the book in 1870, but he discovered to his dismay that the writing did not come easily. The events he was trying to remember had taken place in the Washoe County of Nevada almost a decade before, end quote. Twain looked through the memorandum book of his brother, Orion, who had accompanied him on his travels ten years before, but found little useful information. 
He referred to his columns from the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise newspaper, but those writings also offered little help. Twain finally began to make headway with this manuscript after Joseph Thompson Goodman, the former editor of the newspaper, turned up in Elmira, New York, where Twain had moved with his family. The two men began to reminisce about their time together in Nevada, and, indeed, Twain's writing took off. From my own unpublished journal, Wednesday, June 13, 1973, I wrote, quote, My first ride, with Gary and his boys, took me over familiar territory from the Elkhorn River watershed through the rolling hills of northeastern Nebraska to the Missouri River. Gary wanted to know about my trip. I told him I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know how to get there, but I thought I would understand when I arrived. He nodded and told me he wished he could come along for the adventures, end quote. Part of the motivation for my trip in 1973 came from another journey two years earlier. During the summer of 1971, I rode a 10-speed Schwinn Continental bicycle from my hometown of Norfolk to Estes Park, Colorado, down to Denver and back home, a journey of about 1,200 miles over 16 days. I kept no notes of that trip, but I do recall the many hours of pedaling through western Nebraska with time to let my thoughts expand over the miles to focus on a particular topic as I rode. While in Denver, I attended a screening of the 1969 countercultural film Easy Rider at a theater on Colvex Avenue, locking my bike to a fence along the building. At the time, the film, made by Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper, without a script or even much of an idea of the final product, made a huge impression on me in terms of independence, exploration, and injustice of individuals who reside out of societal expectations. was to be free, and that's the way it turned out to be. Flow, river, flow, let your waters wash down, take me from this road. While preparing this essay, I rewatched Easy Rider and found the filmmaking amateurish, the motorcycles highly unstable, the drug dealing disturbing, but the portrayals of the characters felt true and compelling more than half a century later. True to the nature of the film, the director, the producer, and the crew loaded up a truck with equipment and hit the highway, filming along the way and making up the plot as they went. You know, while modern scholars and intellectuals have recently acknowledged a sensitivity to the appropriation of native lands, one scene in the movie reminded me that certain individuals had an understanding of injustice a half century ago. After picking up a hitchhiker, Billy, Hopper, and Wyatt, Fonda, stopped to camp overnight near some Native American ruins. While sitting around a campfire smoking dope, Billy Needles' Stranger on Highway played by Lou Askew, about the location of a communal settlement in the desert where they're headed. They know you in this place? <laughs> this place we're coming to? No, the place we're at now. This place? <laughs> <laughs> You're right on top of them. I'm right on top of them? Yeah. The people this place belongs to are buried right under you. You be, could be a trifle polite. Yeah. Trifle polite? <laughs> a small thing to ask. This example shows how the journey can educate travelers and how these experiences can affect perceptions and attitudes. I viewed the scene more than 50 years ago. I have no way to gauge whether this influenced my thinking, but I can only assume that it helped to inform my view of indigenous populations and their claims to the land. Another example of synthesizing experiences into the written word comes from John Steinbeck. By 1960, the author had spent most of the previous decade abroad. In an effort to relearn about his own country, he planned a trip with his dog, Charlie. While this came near the end of his writing career, this still shows the desire of an artist-creator to collect experiences. In an introduction to the 50th anniversary edition of John Steinbeck's book, 
travels with Charlie in search of America. Novelist and poet Jay Perini writes about Steinbeck's ability to place his characters in a specific setting. Quote, Part of what makes Steinbeck's best fiction so compelling is the author's innate sense of landscape, both natural and human, and the crucial knit of people with their setting. End quote. Steinbeck neatly distills the difference between the physical world and the emotional interior world populated by stories. Steinbeck writes, quote, Most areas of the world may be placed in latitude and longitude, described chemically in their earth, sky, and water, rooted and fuzzed over with identified flora and, and people with known fauna. There's no end to it. There are others where fable, myth, preconception, love, longing, and prejudice step in and so distorts a cool, clear appraisal that a kind of high-colored magical confusion takes permanent hold, End quote. During my own personal journey during the summer of 1973, I spent the first week finding my bearings and adapting to a nomadic life. While hitchhiking in the Black Hills, I spent an afternoon waiting for a ride in Custer State Park uncomfortably close to some bison. Jay drove a pickup towing a camper trailer. Recently retired, he wanted to travel, but his wife had no interest in a trip of any sort. So he set off by himself. After several days on the road, he wanted some conversation. I quickly understood the transactional nature of our situation. He needed to talk. I needed a ride. He talked. I rode listening to his stories while interjecting affirmations of active listening. Wow, what happened next? Or, your wife really said that? Or, or I'm so sorry to hear about that. I quickly picked up the subtext of our conversation, that Jay had spent a life doing what was expected of him as a husband, father, and community member. Now retired with a lack of connections, he drove the back roads of South Dakota looking for a deeper meaning in his life. After he dropped me off at an intersection near Badlands National Park, I wrote in my journal, quote, I feel a certain sense of sadness for Jay. Like all of us, he's looking for connection and not finding it, experiencing the same loneliness he felt at home, but now in campgrounds in the Black Hills of South Dakota, end quote. While hitchhiking around the Black Hills, I fell in with Stefan Nerudi, a high school English teacher who quit his job after his first year of teaching in Three Rivers, Michigan, gathered his belongings, and hit the road. We fell into an easy alliance, traveling together with plans to see how far we could get. One memorable evening, we found ourselves in Spearfish, South Dakota, home of the summer outdoor production of the Black Hills Passion Play. On a lark, we decided to attend the show, not as paying audience members, but as interlopers sneaking through the outdoor set like members of a special forces team, hiding in the bushes, and getting as close to Jesus on the cross as we could without attracting any attention. The adventure hardly merits noting, except I used that premise for a short story several decades later. Traveling west beyond the Black Hills mainly involved a series of short rides. By the time we landed in Buffalo, we learned from certain members of the law enforcement community that uh, lawmakers had prohibited hitchhiking in the entire state of Wyoming. I recalled spending a very long night sleeping under an awning at an A&W root beer drive-in during a constant thunderstorm, avoiding the watchful eyes of the police. The next day, we situated ourselves westbound on U.S. Highway 16, on the way to Ten Sleep, Wyoming. In my journal, I noted our ascent of the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains while seated in the back of a pickup, watching my perspective of the horizon widen as we drove higher in elevation. As with my bicycle trip two years earlier, I encountered long stretches of time spent waiting for a ride. To fill that time, I allowed my mind to wander. As a hitchhiker in the 1970s, appearances meant the difference between getting a ride and going nowhere. I sought to appear engaging, cheerful, interesting, and certainly non-threatening. Most of the time, I tried to achieve that by just standing next to my backpack, giving me plenty of time to think in the summer sunshine. 
These long stretches of empty time help me sort through my values to consider how I relate to animals, the natural world, a sense of time, and concepts as abstract as the weather, the future, the past, our diets, or metaphysical stages. At the time, I had no language for these thoughts. I recently learned of the work of philosopher and English professor Timothy Morton. I now understand that other people not only share these ideas and exercises, they also have expanded on them in meaningful ways. Greg Gerard writes about Morton's work in Ecocriticism, starting off a chapter about Morton's concepts with a simple question, what comes to mind when you think of nature? In a Facebook interview, Morton explained that, quote, ontology is the study of how things exist, not what exists. That's a common mistake, end quote. They go on to give an example, quote, I'm simply saying that if something exists, say for example a sentence, if sentences are real and sentences exist, then they exist in the same way as spoons. They exist in the way that they have a kind of gap between what they are and how they appear. In his essay, Imagining Ecology Without Nature, Morton writes about how distraction is the subjective form of the decline of the aesthetic distance. They compare a type of ignorance, quote, born of living in a channel-serving, easy, clean environment, end quote. Morton writes about the difference between the amount of ignorance people can tolerate versus the desire of distraction. All these explorations focus on object-oriented philosophy through political implications, the connection to non-human objects, and the desire for human objectification. I find these concepts difficult to fully understand, but intuitively affirming. In the mountains of Colorado, I bushwhacked up Red Elephant Mountain at 11,000 Peak in the Mount Zirkle Wilderness area, picking my way through stands of lodgepole pine and rock rubble fields with no trail or guides. Near the top of the mountain, in an area about the size of five football fields, I stumbled upon a trash heap of rusted food cans well above the tree line. Using Morton's ontological view, those cans exist in that place equal to my intrusion into this wilderness. I continued hitchhiking through Yellowstone National Park, taking a memorable ride in the back of a pickup from the park's north entrance through Paradise Valley to Livingston, Montana. In my journal, I wrote, quote, Amazing ride today through a valley north of Yellowstone, mountains on all sides, following the Yellowstone River as it flows north, one of the few major rivers to do that. Beginning in 1990, I spent 17 years in the Yellowstone area. I frequently made the 60-mile trip through Paradise Valley, each time awed by the mountains. Each year, more and more yard lights appeared as people built houses in that area including Peter Fonda, as pastures became residential areas and the sense of wilderness diminished ever so slightly. Each trip through Paradise Valley evoked a different feeling, a different vision, and a different tilt to the land and the sky. I remember seeing a layer of golden stratocumulus clouds lined up from the zenith of the sky to the western horizon, like a set of golden stair steps almost touching the tops of the Gallatin Range. In Blue Highway, A Journey into America, Least Heat Moon writes about stopping for lunch near a stream in Missouri. Quote, Had I gone looking for some particular place rather than any place, I'd never have found this spring under the sycamores. Since leaving home, I fell for the first time at rest. Sitting in the moment, I practiced on that god-awful difficulty of just paying attention. End quote. Had I gone looking for a bank of golden clouds, I would have never found them. My travels have taught me to observe the world and to anticipate the wonders. In a world that specializes in distractions, paying attention often requires a monumental amount of effort. In September of this year, 2023, I decided to give myself another opportunity to travel, this time in a van with most of the comforts of home. I allowed myself three weeks on this trip and began making arrangements, including three nights in a cabin in the Old Faithful area of Yellowstone National Park. 
I also booked two nights in a Forest Service cabin at 10,000 feet in the snowy range of Wyoming, along with visits to my son in Oregon and another visit with a high school friend in Kalispell, Montana. My itinerary quickly filled up. I had to calculate the time needed to travel between my various destinations. In addition, I had to keep up with three graduate-level classes. The trip quickly turned from a leisurely drive across America to a race between Internet hotspots at public libraries, truck stops, and rest areas along the way. It took me several months after the 2023 trip to fully understand the missing element compared to my travels in 1973, time. While hitchhiking, I had no particular destination and no particular time frame. Getting stuck for 48 hours in Deer Lodge, Montana meant nothing in terms of my travels. I traded stories with other hitchhikers, shared meals in city parks, and spent a night sleeping under a railroad bridge, a place that offered great shelter, security, and comfort until a freight train passed 30 feet over my head at 2 a.m. Fifty years later, it never occurred to me that I needed unstructured time to experience my travels. Reflecting on his travel experiences, Least Heat Moon writes intelligently about the element of time in Riding Blue Highways. He writes of a case of food poisoning, something that caused him to stay in bed for three days. Quote, the hours in bed gave opportunity to think and take notes and read without trying to write at the same time. It was then I began to understand the critical value of going slowly enough to layer a book. Drafts are strata and they can be read like an archaeological record, one stratum leading to another. End quote. Not to belabor the point, Least Heat Moon learned the lesson much quicker than I did. He writes, quote, Count me among the mossback. In our times, I think life gets lived too fast, too mindlessly, and too many of us will reach our finality without having slowed enough to evaluate and enrich the journey. End quote. After returning home, I kept trying to understand why this most recent trip, a journey that used some of the same roads I traveled 50 years ago, felt so disconnected and unsatisfying. I thought about the changes in society, the injection of fear into our lives, and the polarization of political ideas. The responsibility rests entirely with me as I zoom from one self-imposed obligation to another. Least Heat Moon also notes about time in regard to the act of writing, quote, speed is an enemy of craft and, even more, depth, unquote. Well, gathering sources for this essay, I consider Jack Kerouac's On the Road as a piece of literature that would exemplify travel as an impetus for storytelling. As I revisited the book, the frenetic pace of the writing and the characters stood out. In a publication of the original scroll manuscript, Joshua Capetz notes in the introduction, quote, in the scroll manuscript, Kerouac establishes another argument dependent upon both sides of its presumptive opposition when he foregrounds the protagonist's attempt to overcome the constrictions of time. Cassidy's techniques for operating outside of time, however, rely upon his strict adherence to it, end quote. Capetz also writes about the character's technique of doing, quote, everything at the same time, unquote. A closer reading of On the Road reflects Kerouac's legendary method of writing the novel in a frenzy on a scroll of continuous paper while under the influence of Benzedrine. In an article in The Atlantic, Baylor University professor Alan Jacobs writes about how the drug influenced writers, poets, and scientists, mathematicians, and thousands of creative people. By 1957, when Viking Press released On the Road, professionals had begun to understand the dangerous side effects of recreational use of benzedrine, a type of amphetamine. Jacobs notes that, quote, the high-speed, high-energy way was being replaced by something slower, cooler, Kerouac's novel On the Road and Miles Davis's record The Birth of the Cool came out in the same year, but the former was a relic of the recent past and the later the wave of the future, end quote. While I rejected the tempo of On the Road, Kerouac's character revealed an interesting observation while hitchhiking, quote, quote, 
One of the biggest troubles hitchhiking is having to talk to innumerable people. Make them feel that they didn't make a mistake picking you up, even go as far as to entertain them almost. All of which is a great strain when you're going all the way. I don't plan to sleep in hotels, end quote. Obviously, one person's, quote, great strain, unquote, is another person's opportunity to connect. I traveled to Seattle with adventures along the way, including an overnight house party filled with drugs and music. For my journal, July 6, 1973, quote, Two guys picked me up while I hitched down I-5 after trying to get into Vancouver. They took me to a house party in the North Beacon Hill neighborhood of Seattle. I had no idea where I was except at an old house filled with people smoking hash and listening to Led Zeppelin on a stereo. I found my way into the yard and unrolled my sleeping bag and slept like a baby until the morning when I awoke to an empty house. I found an on-ramp for I-5 and picked up where I left off, back on the highway. End quote. From Olympic National Park down U.S. Highway 101, I followed the coast through Portland, Northern California, and eventually to San Francisco and then Los Angeles. Each step along the way opened my eyes to a wide variety of different environments, different landscapes, and different people. For a more contemporary view of travel literature, especially focusing on the area of the West Coast, I watched Alexander Payne's 2004 film Sideways, a story about two friends who travel to the wine country of Northern California. As I watched the film, I decided it had nothing to offer in terms of my exploration of travel and storytelling. Yes, the characters drive several hours to spend a weekend enjoying various wines as part of a bachelor celebration, but the strength of the story comes from the personal interaction between the buddies, Miles, Paul Giamatti, and Jack, Thomas Hayden Church, except for one scene that stood out to me. After a semester of reading dystopian novels, Considering the perils of climate change, the dwindling state of our natural resources, and the pending devastation of our world, this scene gave me a sense of hope and encouragement. Miles, an English teacher, failed novelist, and self-avowed wine snob, is asked by a woman who still finds him attractive why he's into Pinot Noir wines. Sitting on the porch of her house on a perfect California evening, while both sipping wine, he answers, It's a hard grape to grow, as you know, right? It's, uh, it's thin skin, temperamental, ripens early. It's, you know, it's not a survivor like Cabernet, which can just grow anywhere and uh, thrive even when it's neglected. No, Pinot needs constant care and attention. You know, and in fact, it can only grow in these really specific little tucked away corners of the world. And, and only the most patient and nurturing of growers can do it, really. Only somebody who really takes the time to understand Pino's potential can then coax it into its fullest expression. And then, I mean, Oh, it's flavors. They're just the most haunting and brilliant and thrilling and subtle and ancient on the planet. This monologue gave me hope. It acknowledged that things can exist in slender environmental areas and that those things, animals, food, grapes, can elicit such powerful emotions. Whether profound storytelling or clever marketing, the film had an effect. A study detailed in the 2009 issue of Wines and Vines showed a marked increase in the sales of Pinot wines in the western United States following the release of Sideways, compared to a slight decrease in sales of Merlot. I stumbled upon the final element of my research for this project while listening to NPR. I learned of the work of climate scientist Kim Nichols, the author of Under the Sky We Make, How to Be a Human in a Warming World. In a Facebook video, the author outlines three things we, as humans, can do in our everyday lives. Those three things, facts, feelings, and action. Facts. It's warming. It's us. We're sure. It's bad. We can fix it. Nichols notes that humans have the power to stop climate change, starting with two things. One, leave fossil fuels in the ground. And two, we need to work with and not destroy nature. Nature. 
She admits that those concepts are simple but not easy to implement. Feelings. Feelings can point out our values and help clarify what really matters. For me, this is where eco-criticism comes into the equation, a place where storytellers can make a difference. Climate acceptance comes after we address ignorance, avoidance, and a feeling of doom. Action. As stakeholders in climate change, we can approach the problem as consumers, professionals, role models, investors, and responsible climate citizens. As an arts journalist, I like to ask other artists this simple question. Who gets to tell stories? On one level, novelists and filmmakers command the largest audiences. On another level, we constantly tell stories about our lives and experiences to our friends, families, and almost anyone who will listen. We tell stories through bumper stickers, through the t-shirts we wear, through the holiday decorations we place on our houses, through the sports we enjoy. A writing manual published in 1919 called, Intimidatingly Enough, 10 Million Photoplay Plots by Wycliffe Aber Hill boils the possible number of basic plots down to 37. Another writer, English journalist and satirist Christopher Booker, reduced the number of plots to seven. Overcoming the Monster, Rags to Riches, The Quest, Voyage and Return, Comedy, Tragedy, Rebirth, and The Rule of Three. With printing on demand, podcast, video editing software, phones equipped with video capabilities, and the entire internet at our disposal, I believe the act of telling stories has never been easier. On a certain level, all stories can feel the same. British novelist and literary film critic Adam Mars Jones dismissed the work of Booker when he wrote that Booker, quote, sets up criteria for art and ends up condemning Rigoletto, The Cherry Orchard, Wagner, Proust, Joyce, Kafka, and Lawrence, the list goes on, while praising Crocodile Dundee, E.T., and Terminator 2, end quote. Instead of seeking novelty and emphasizing unique stories, creators who use eco-criticism will find success and meaning through compelling stories told with empathy and at the correct time, when audiences are ready to receive the important messages. The commonalities of stories, whether one of the 37 identified type or the seven plots promoted by Booker or even a plot lifted directly from 10 million photoplay plots, that matters little. What matters is the fact that storytellers keep relating stories to each of us and that we stay open to these stories as we stagger back with our hypothetical load of meat and ivory.